Okay, let's get started with chapter 10, which is a discussion of probabilistic reasoning. Now the reason why understanding probabilities is so important in psychological research is that research is completely probabilistic. And I think you'll understand that better as we go along. Okay. I have a lot of demonstrations that I like to do in class and take student votes and things like that. So you're getting a teeny tiny bit robbed of some of the you know, richness of what could be going on in the classroom if we were in actual class. But play along. Maybe you could show part of this to the people who are around you and get them to vote and see what happens. Um, anyway, he, so what we're looking at here is a die. You're seeing two of the four green sides. I drew a little arrow. The other two sides are also green. So sort of all around the circumference of the die is green. And then the front and the back panels are both red. So you've got four green sides and two red sides on this die. Okay. So you're offered a bet. You'll be paid $25 if you correctly predict the sequence of colors that are rolled with this die. Now remember the die has four green sides and two red sides. Okay. Which pattern is more likely? Red, green, red, 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 or green, red, green, red, red, red. Okay, ask everybody around you, what do they think? Get a little, take a little poll. <laughs> um, what I like to do in class is ask students to vote anonymously using Socrative, which is a really cool um, system that uses your cell phone to vote. Anyway, what people tend to vote for is the second pattern. Green, red, green, red, red, red. And when I ask them to explain why they pick that one, they usually say, well, because there are four green sides. So green should come up more often than red should come up. Four versus two reds, it should be green twice as often as it's red. The second pattern, green, red, green, red, 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 has more greens and so it looks more like what you would expect. That's pretty good logic except for you'll notice that the two sequences are identical. Red, green, red, 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 green, red, 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 except for that a, a green's been added to the front. So there's one more outcome in the um, string over here on the right than there is on the string on the on the left. Why is that important? Well, if you're offered a bet, you are going to always have a better chance of winning if you predict the shorter outcome than the longer outcome. It doesn't even matter what that sequence of letters is on the left. The fact that there are only five outcomes listed means by definition you only have to be right five times as opposed to the one on the right where you'd have to be right six times. That's harder. So taking out our incorrect logic about the fact that since there are four green sides, there has to be more greens than reds. That's incorrect logic to believe that. Um, in a string this short, um, we should we should always just go with the shorter of the two strings. If we're offered two strings that are, are um, one's longer than the other, always go with the shorter one. Now, the fact that there are more greens than reds should become relevant if we're going to roll the die a hundred times. But in a string of five or six outcomes, it really doesn't matter um, what the proportions are on the die. It's such a short string, anything really could happen. And that's the important thing in probabilities, is to understand that in the short run, it's really hard to make predictions. In the long run, over time, the probabilities will start to um, reveal themselves. Okay, so I thought I'd share with you some interesting examples of how often we get sucked into miracles. I hear it all the time. Of course, for all of us who have children, our, our children are miracles. Of course they are. Uh, it, uh, nothing magical even has to happen to make them exist. Just the fact that now we're parents, <laughs> that we made another human being makes them seem like miracles. So I'm not discounting any of that. Um, but when a person survives a tragedy, if um, 
you know, a baby is born despite the odds, you know, you were told you should never be able to have children, those kinds of things, that doesn't necessarily make it a, a miracle. But people tend to focus in on these person who statistics. Oh, I, I know this person who, insert whatever amazing outcome. I received this in the, in my email, um, after they redesigned the $20 bill. And I guess that $20 bill could be construed as looking like the burning twin towers, right? But I don't think we should be sucked in by this, I don't know, kind of dramatic question here. What are the odds that a simple geometric folding of the $20 bill would accidentally contain a representation of both terror attacks? Um, if you flip the bill over and fold it a different direction, you get what appears to be the Pentagon burning. What are the odds that a simple geometric folding, um, about 100% <laughs> is what I'm going to say. The odds are 100 that if a person goofs around, folds things up, and looks at it through a particular lens, that yes, I guess it, you know, I'm looking at it like everything looks like the Twin Tower attacks during this era, because everybody was scared at the time and stuff. Yeah, it looked like the Twin Towers, I guess. 15 years later now, what is this 2015, so I guess it's 14 years later now, it doesn't even look that much like the Twin Towers to me anymore. At the time, it kind of did. Now it doesn't even really look like it anymore to me. How about this one? You hear this all the time. You don't even have to read the, the example. You've seen these headlines. Doctors said I'd never walk again. Miracle recovery. Um, breast cancer survivor delivers miracle baby. Right? She was told that she'd never be able to have children. Um, are these miracles or are these just on the smaller side of the probabilities. When a doctor tells you that you're, you're not likely to walk again, what they're saying is that in a hundred cases like yours, only about 90, only about nine or ten out of a hundred might walk again. So more than likely you're not going to walk again. Now you might happen to be in, in that position of being one of the nine or ten. Is, does that make you a miracle or does that just make you on the smaller side of the, of the probability. You know, when you're told that you probably aren't going to be able to ke conceive children, it's never 100%. I mean, unless they remove your reproductive organs, there's, it's not going to be 100%. They're telling you the odds, and the odds are not in your favor. Um, if you beat those odds, if you happen to be in that smaller side, that doesn't make it a miracle. It just makes it the smaller side of the probabilities. Here we have a couple of brothers from another mother. Oh, they're so cute. And it is kind of cute to see, you know, this cross species fur pattern. They do look like little twins, right? Of course, how many animals have you seen with that fur pattern? I had a cat when I was growing up that, that her fur pattern looked a lot like that. And I remember when I was growing up, she seemed like a very unusual cat to me. And then as I got older, I've started to realize a lot of cats have that fur pattern. Is it a miracle? No. It's called genes, and there's only so many variations on color combinations on fur. And for some reason, I guess the colors tend to cling around their ears and their faces like that. I don't know. Anyway, I'm not a geneticist. I'm just a person who's going to say, that's not a miracle. How about this one? Oh my gosh, it's a miracle. The crane is hanging the moon. Oh my gosh. Well, if you leave the crane in that position, this miracle will probably occur again next month at exactly this same time, right? Because every 28 days, the moon's in that spot. So if you leave the crane there, the moon will come back. Um, is it a miracle? No. It's the kind of thing that catches our attention, though. And that's one of the things that us humans do. Things that catch our attention, we think are really like, wow, I did not expect that to happen. Therefore, it must be some kind of miracle. It must be you're a special person who had that happen to you, um, as opposed to it's probably just probabilities. All right, I'm going to share with you some psychological findings, and I hope I will hit on something that will make you say, what? Because it's something personally relevant to you. Maybe this one will be. Couples who live together before marriage are more likely to divorce. Now, psychological studies have shown this for about 20 years they've been doing research on um, the success rates of marriages that start from the get-go, um, first time you live together is after the wedding, versus those that start with um, cohabitation prior to marriage.
And what they've found time and time again is that those couples who live together before they get married are more likely to, to divorce than those couples who don't live together before they get married. Now, if, you're, if you are a couple, if you are one member of, of a couple who's living together and you haven't gotten married and you plan on getting married, um, you might look at this finding and say, well, they're wrong. That's not right. You know, it's going to work for me or my, and my boyfriend or girlfriend. Or um, you might say, maybe you're a person who lived together before you got married and now you're married and you're like, see, it worked out. Um, you got to always remember that you just might be in the smaller side of the statistic. Now let me tell you what the statistics actual values are. Um, couples who do not live together before they get married have about a 28 percent chance of divorcing within 20 years. Uh, first off let's all just enjoy that statistic because it's so different from what you hear in the media, right? But the Census Bureau, Bureau data does not lie. Couples who for whom it is the first marriage for both partners who did not live together before they got married have a 28% chance of divorcing within the first 20 years of their marriage. Um, couples who live together before they get married and it's the first marriage for both partners have a 38% chance of divorcing within 20 years. Okay, that's not a guarantee, is it? It's You go from 28% chance to 38% chance. Now, if you're a member of a couple who's living together or you're a member of a couple who lived together before you guys ultimately got married, now you're saying, okay, well, it's, this, it's a 10% increase. Now, of course, what will sta some people do to try and um, make it seem like more or scarier? They'll say things like, you have a 50% greater chance of divorce because you go from 28% to 38%. That's roughly 50-ish percent chance. Yeah. The thing is, you go from 28% to 38% chance on average. And then, of course, you know, we'll talk about um, clinical data um, in the next chapter, but um, every couple is different, right? How about this one? In case that first one didn't get you. Girls raised by stepfathers start menarche earlier. Menarche is a girl's first period. Girls raised by stepfathers start menarche earlier. Now, if you are if you are a girl who was raised by a stepfather, I'm sure you're going, what? <laughs> My period came early because I have a stepfather? Now, I didn't necessarily say that your period came early because you ha have a stepfather. What I said is that girls who were raised by stepfathers start men menarche earlier. It's, a, it's an average. I can't say anything about an individual. All I can say is that on average, girls who are raised by stepfathers tend to reach menarche earlier than girls who are ra raised by their biological fathers. A lot of explanations have been attempted to um, account for this. Um, having a stepfather around makes you want to leave the house earlier. I, all sorts of crazy stuff. I don't know why that, why that finding has been obtained time and time again. Um, but it is an actual finding. It doesn't mean for every individual that it's true. Okay, in case uh, I haven't hit everybody, how about this one, guys in, in the class? Boys who play violent video games are more aggressive. Again, got to take it with a grain of salt, right? Because if you're a guy who plays video games and you're not an aggressive guy, you're like, okay, that's just wrong. You got to remember, it's just wrong for you, right? Because there are there's a wide range of aggression scores that were obtained in the studies that have attempted to look at, at the association between aggression and violent video games. There's a wide range from absolutely no evidence of aggression to significant evidence of aggression. The vast majority of boys who played video games on average showed more aggression in their behavior than the vast majority of boys who didn't play violent video games. Of course, in this day and age, what boys have not played violent video games? So it's like the whole pool is tainted, right? <laughs> so I don't know exactly if we can keep testing this question anymore. Um, but the idea is the average, the, the, these findings describe the average and you might be outside the range of the average. And that's the important point to always remember that psychological findings or any other kind of finding, if you're different from the prediction, it doesn't make you a miracle, it doesn't make you an oddball, it doesn't make it you anything except for outside the range of the how the group scored. That's all that really means. Okay, let's go ahead and take a little break and we'll come back and we'll talk about some thinking errors.